pulpits? <laughs> you know, like, don't even lie behind the pulpit. I promise you I'm going to cut down. I'm going to cut down maybe 835, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to get uh, done as much as we possibly can here. All right. Um, we've, we've, last week we left off, and we, we've been talking, of course, um, about Acts chapter 5. We talked about uh, holiness, and I thought it was interesting to note that some of the things that we heard on Sunday night specifically related to that. I don't know if anybody caught that or not, but we actually, my brother actually referenced Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira is absolutely an important element, an aspect to Book of Acts Church. Holiness, righteousness, doing things the right way is absolutely a vital element and, and part of being apostolic. So tonight we're going to move in and we're going to try to cover at least a few chapters because we only have a few more of these nights to cover, uh, cover um, the rest of the book of Acts. So tonight we're going to talk about apostolic ministry. One of the things that I love is it seems like that almost all of these chapters begin and open with a, a statement that illustrates what should be the continuous state of the church when it says, the New King, New King James Version says it this way, Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying. Can I just tell you, ladies and gentlemen, God's church is a progressive church. It's a growing church. It's a church that's moving forward. It's always growing and not just adding to, but a genuine book of Acts church enters into a phase and stage of multiplication. I'm thankful for I'm thankful for five and six getting the Holy Ghost. I'm thankful for those kinds of things. But I'm looking for the days when there's a multiplication that begins to take place in the church. We heard it on Sunday night. My brother referenced it. That he would not be a bit surprised if this church was running a thousand in the next year. Not that the number is significant, but that the revival that it would take for us to get to that number is significant because that number represents a number of souls that are going to have to be born again of water and of spirit for us to reach that. So it's not about us reaching a quote unquote number, but it's about the kind of revival that God wants to send us. And we've got to stop saying, you know, well, when we get all organized and structured and prepared and everything just right, everything just ready. If you recall, one of the first lessons we talked about that God added 5,000 souls, 3,000 souls to a church that just a few days before weren't even spiritual enough to know who was anointed of God to fill the place of Judas as the 12th apostle. And yet that was the church that God handed over a revival of 8,000 souls in just a, few, a, a very short amount of time. If God can do that then, ladies and gentlemen, he's no respecter of persons. And all of these chapters, at least one place, it has literally stated that God had multiplied, he had added to the church, or I'm sorry, he had multiplied the church. It was multiplying in believers. We must believe that the book of Acts church is a church of multiplication. One consistent theme throughout the book of Acts was that the church was always advancing. In the aftermath of the crucifixion, the church multiplied. In the face of questioning from religious leaders, the church multiplied. In the face of internal issues, the church multiplied. In the, church, in the face of persecution, the church multiplied. Can I just tell you, ladies and gentlemen, nothing can stop a Book of Acts church. There is no option. There is no other plan. There is no other concept or idea other than we must be an apostolic Book of Acts church. And when we are... We should not be afraid. What are you afraid of? We should not be afraid of any attack from hell. We should not be afraid of internal issues. We should not be afraid of any of that kind of stuff because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God. We've got to get into a mindset and an attitude where we get a holy dissatisfaction if we're not seeing people pray through to the Holy Ghost and people baptized in Jesus' name and new Bible studies and new things taking place. There ought to be something inside of us that says we need to be driven to the prayer room and pray 
and fast and seek God's face if there's not revival happening. Amen? So God's church is a a church of multiplication. We must not, we cannot settle for anything less than a radical book of Acts church that will not be stymied by any outside or internal force that attempts to thwart revival. So, that leads us to chapter 6. And we find a very interesting issue. I find it interesting in Acts chapter 6 that even in the midst of those who were closest to Jesus, even in the midst of the greatest revival that this world had ever seen, even in the midst of all of that, the church had issues. Sometimes we, we look at the book of Acts and we think the church was perfect. Well, guess what? The church had issues. When you start putting personalities, you start putting people from different backgrounds, all kinds of different opinions and ideas and thoughts, guess what? You're going to have some conflict. People say, well, man, if we, ever, if we ever get rid of conflict in the church, we can really have revival. You know what? The next time that's going to happen, we'll be walking on streets of gold. Because there never has been, there never will be a church minus conflict. To be truly apostolic, you guys have heard me say it many, many times. We must biblically, and I'm going to make up a word tonight, apostolically resolve conflict. If we're genuinely going to be a book of Acts, we must learn to resolve conflict in an apostolic manner. So let's look at this issue. First of all, we find that a conflict arose that was most likely fed from a, a prejudice or at least a perceived prejudice. The Bible says that there were Jews that lived in another land. They called them Grecian Jews. The Grecians were Jewish people that spoke Greek. They felt like that they were somehow possibly being snubbed by Jews that spoke Hebrew particularly as it related uh, to the widows being neglected in daily ministration, taking care and feeding the widows. They felt like that they were being neglected in that aspect. Because, here's the deal, we don't know if that was accurate or not. Right? But can I tell you, there is no place for prejudice in the kingdom of God. I need a bigger amen on that. There is no place for for prejudice of any kind in the, in, in the church, in the book of Acts church. So let's look at it from both sides. If there was prejudice, it was imperative that that prejudice be re- addressed and resolved. Amen? So we as a church better make sure there is no prejudice. Color of skin... Socioeconomic background, what they look like, where they come from, how they smell. Hello? <clears throat> We've got to make sure that we guard ourselves against any prejudice in the house of God. We are called upon to love people the way God loved people. And His Word says, Whosoever will, let them come. There's nobody. Amen? There's nobody that can't come to the kingdom of God. And so we need a a diverse church. We need a, a church with all kinds of different people from different backgrounds, different races. Can I get a witness from somebody? Bishop Jordan can tell you. I told him, they'd asked me about a church not too far from here. And I said, you know what, Bishop? I, I, I appreciate, and I'm honored that you would ask about that. This was a couple of years, that was last year, year, maybe a year ago, a year and a half ago. And I told him, I said, you know what, I appreciate the invitation, but you know what? I, I, I believe God has called me to be a part of a, of a diverse church, of a church with multiple ethnic backgrounds. And come, hey Amen, anybody want that kind of church? I want the church to reflect what heaven's going to look like. Every nation, every tribe, every tongue. And I'm just going to tell you right now, there is no such thing as a white church. There's the church. We need to make sure we have that kind of a mindset, that kind of an attitude. 
Now, we may have some difficulty at times ministering because of language barriers, but that ought to be the only barrier that we attempt to address and cross. But I want, I want, to, be in, I want to be a church where everybody feels welcome. They feel like this is a place where they can belong. They can be a part of the family, regardless of where they come from, how much money they have, what they look like, any of that kind of stuff. Amen? Now, let's look at it from the flip side, because it's easy to address that side. We don't know if this was true or not. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Because some people bring with them their own perceived prejudice. And so sometimes people will come into the church and they feel like it's me against the world. Well, guess what? In the kingdom of God, you've got to leave that behind. The reality is that might say more about you than it says about the rest of the people. People, oh, well, they're always out to get me and they're always this and they're not taking care of this and they're not doing this. You know what? If it's everybody else, it's probably not. Right? If it's everybody else, <clears throat> you might, you might want to take a look in the mirror and think because it might be you. Okay, so we've got individuals, we've got to lay down. Some of us have been through some stuff, and we come in with a little chip on our shoulder. Well, guess what? When you come into the kingdom of God, you're baptized into the family. You don't need a chip on your shoulder because this is a place where we're going to love you, we're going to support you, we're going to care for you. So get the chip off your shoulder and be a part of the family. Is that okay? Would y'all pray for my voice? God will help me. So they had this issue. The Grecians felt that the Jews looked at them as a lower class of Jew. And so this issue, this issue arose. Okay, so we had this conflict. Church is not going to be absence of conflict, but here's the deal. To be apostolic, what did they do? They came together. They developed a solution. It is imperative that we not allow perception or even misperception or even conflict and differences to distract us from the purpose and mission of reaching the lost. We will have issues that arise from time to time, but the way we handle those differences will determine whether or not we will truly be apostolic. This was an issue that could have derailed the revival that God had intended for them to have. It could have stopped the revival. But you want to know what happened? I'm going to show you what happened in just a moment. But not, it didn't stop the church. It didn't stop revival. It actually increased revival. Sometimes God can use internal conflict and internal issues to be something that perpetuates revival, not something that holds revival back. It all depends on your attitude. It all depends on your view and on your perspective. As a result of resolving the conflict, conflict biblically, Acts 6 and 7 says this, And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples was multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. Because the conflict was resolved uh, biblically, and in an apostolic manner, the church was multiplied, and they had a continuation of the revival that had been taking place for the first five chapters. Anybody want to be a part of that church? I don't want any issue. I don't want any internal conflict. I don't want any problem to stop the revival that God has intended for us to have. We won't be derailed by that stuff. You know what we're going to do? If there's conflict and there are issues, we're going to sit down. We're going to resolve it together biblically. They came up with a plan. They came up with a program. You know what the Bible says? Here, watch this. You want to talk about miraculous? The Bible says that all disciples were well pleased with the decision. Y'all, that's miraculous. Right? I mean, you can't, get in, you can't get everybody to agree on anything. But in this situation, everybody was well pleased with the resolution that took place. That represents the apostolic mindset. That represents that... The church, the cause, is bigger than my own personal individual needs. Right? There were some folks, you know, they, they, they got their nose out of joint. They were a little upset about something. But when they got together, they came up with the resolution. It may not have been a perfect solution. It may not have been, you know, they, some may have wanted more than this. But the Bible says they were all well pleased with the solution and the decision. There's got to be a workable spirit inside of us that says, I may not always have everything that I want or get everything that I want, but you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get on board. I'm going to support. I'm going to be a part because the cause is greater than my own individual ideas. Is that okay? 
All right, so that's resolving conflict biblically. Now, also contained in this, and I'm really trying to hurry. I'm, I'm cutting this way down. But also contained in this, we get tremendous insight into real, genuine apostolic ministry. And this, um, it, it doesn't make me uncomfortable, so hopefully it doesn't make you uncomfortable. But inside of this conflict, we get revelation about apostolic ministry. When they came to Peter, they had this conflict. So number one, we have to understand that there's a lot of ministry that has to be taken care of in a revival church. Right? When you have things like Second Helpings Ministry, you need people to cook, you need volunteers to clean up, you need people to drive vans, you need people to pick up trash. You have Sunday school, you need teachers for all the age groups, and you start growing, and you can't, you can't stick one poor teacher in a room with 75 four-year-olds. Right? At least, you know, we'll, we'll find that poor teacher, you know, tied up and stuffed in a trash can somewhere. It takes, in a revival growing church, guess what? It takes everybody coming together, everybody pulling together, and everybody being apart. There's a lot of work that goes into being a revival church. And I'll just be honest with you. There are some folks that say verbally that they want a revival church, but they don't show it with their behavior. Woo. Hello? They say, oh, we want revival. We want revival. Hey, listen, would you be available to help out with this? No, I, I'm too busy. You're saying verbally that you want revival, but behaviorally you're saying a totally and completely different message. Right? Right? Here's, here's the reality. The reality is, if everybody's pulling their own weight and everybody's involved, everybody's doing stuff, nobody will get burnt out. The reason people get burnt out working in the church is because there's two or three folks that are involved in every ministry. They're doing every possible thing they can do. They're there late, they're cleaning, they're doing this, they're doing that. They're doing everything that they can to do. And so there's a few folks that get burnt out. But if we'll all pull together, if we'll all be a part, if we'll all be involved, nobody has to get burnt out. Is there going to be some sacrifice? Absolutely. If you want to be a book of Acts church, guess what? You're going to have to sacrifice some stuff. Is this okay? Do I need to shut down right now and just... Is this okay? There's a lot of work that goes into being a book of Acts church. It's not all just cartwheels, backflips, and praying people through. There's a lot of ministry that has to happen. Somebody told me the other day, they said, man, ministry is awesome if it wasn't for the people. And I looked at him and I said, don't ever say it again. It wasn't in this church. It was where I was preaching a couple weeks ago. I looked at him and I said, don't ever say it again. Even joking, don't ever say it. Because ministry is about nothing but people. There is no ministry. Who are you going to preach to? you going to preach to the pews? They don't respond. About as much as some people. No, I'm just kidding. I shouldn't even have said that. I'm sorry. That just came out. I tried to stop it and it just... <laughs> Having a revival church requires effort. It requires work. But can I tell you, it's worth it, ladies and gentlemen. It's worth it. It's worth the sacrifice. It's worth a little bit of sweat. It's worth some tears. It's worth putting the time in to make it happen when you see guys like this receiving the Holy Ghost. And you see people coming and God changing their lives. That's what makes it worthwhile. Amen? So there's a lot of work that goes into it. One of the Best things that a, cur a church can do. We're talking about apostolic ministry. So they have this issue. Peter says, we, we've all heard it talked about. Peter says, it's not good for us to, to stop the word of God, stop studying the word of God, to leave wor the word of God, leave prayer, to minister to tables. Okay? It wasn't that Peter was trying to get out of work. You want to talk about apostolic ministry? Or apostolic an apostolic attitude, an apostolic church? It wasn't, it wasn't that Peter was trying to get out of work and it wasn't perceived by the people that Peter was trying to get out of work. That's an apostolic mindset and an attitude. Peter said, listen, you don't want to know what the best thing for the church is? is you, if you can free us up to stay in the word and to stay in prayer because he didn't know this. And maybe he had an inkling. But there, were going to be some, there was going to be some serious persecution that was going to come. 
And they needed a word. They needed direction. They needed a, they needed leadership that was in prayer. They needed, they needed leadership that wasn't just preached. They needed a leadership that was in the word of God and hearing the voice of God. That's what they needed in that hour. And so Peter said, look, this is a, this is an important ministry. This is not this. And we're going to talk about this and just say, this is not some secondary thing. This is an important thing that needs to take place. But the leadership, you need to free us up so we can be in the word of God and praying and studying. One of the great things that I love about this church is that the church is mature enough to have the guys that come in and the, the elders, the deacons, the, the ministers that come in uh, throughout the week and do the, 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 the hospital visitations. You know, Brother McConnell, a few weeks ago or last week or whatever it was, two weeks ago, went to, to pray with Brother Rick Condon. Brother Condon didn't feel slighted because Bishop didn't go pray for him. He didn't feel slighted because Brother Trzinski didn't pray for him or because I didn't go pray for him. You know what he did? They began to pray. He said, man, the power of the Holy Ghost fell in that room so powerful and so strong. He said, you could feel what was happening. You could feel God doing it. And within less than 24 hours, God had performed a miracle in his vision. That's a sign of a book of Acts church where people understand there are other people that are anointed of God. Amen. And this is not something new. This is something that's been going on since the heritage of this church with Brother Condon. Brother Kenzie entrusted him. See miracle signs and wonders. Right? That's a sign of a book of Acts church and it's continued on. Understanding. Listen, folks. You know this. You, you've got a leadership team. Bishop is not scared of rolling up the sleeves and working. Brother Terzinski, my Lord. Does that dude ever quit working? You know, every once in a while, like when we have basketball games and stuff, I'll, I'll like beat him to the closet to get the broom because I know that's where he's headed. Right? So you have, you have a leadership team that you, you know they're going to work hard. They're going to be a part of But can I tell you one of, the, one of the most rewarding things is when, when leadership can feel freed to get along with God and get a fresh word from heaven for the church and, and to, to be, in, be in prayer and be studying and get a word from God for you. Listen, I'm not afraid of work, y'all. Roll up the sleeves. Let's get, let's get it done. Let's work. But, a, but to really maintain and sustain the book of Acts revival, everybody has to step up and get to their place of ministry. I want you to notice, they didn't pick out seven ding They didn't pick out seven guys that just happened to be available. Well, these guys, not, you know, not, they're not doing anything else. So might as well use these guys. They picked out seven guys. And watch, watch what the report was of the seven guys. Seven men who were of an honest report, who were full of the Holy Ghost, who were full of wisdom. You read about Stephen, uh, verse number 8 in Acts chapter 6, says Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. These were powerful men of God, mightily used by God. That's a sign of a book of Acts church. Not one man who's the center of attention doing it all. You know, bring everybody to me and I'll pray for them and they'll get healed. A book of Acts church understands that there's anointing and there's power sitting in the congregation and empowers them. And Stephen and Philip and all the other guys, they didn't think it, you know, well, man, look at all these miracles I'm doing. I ought to be like Peter. I ought, to, I ought to be the center of the church. Now, none of them said that. They just went about ministry and turned cities upside down. Turned upside down because of their ministry. They were anointed. They were anointed by the apostles. They were anointed by God to do the work. The next two chapters, chapter 7 and chapter 8, are devoted specifically to the exploits of these great men who served food, and ministered to widows. We think, oh man, the general conference preachers, that's the guy, that's, that's the dude, you know. I mean, guys that preach all these conventions, that's really the guy. You want to know who the guy is? The guy is who's the, 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 the person who's anointed by God, serves his position, and allows himself to be used by the Spirit of God. Stephen did great wonders. Acts chapter 7 records one of the most powerful sermons and messages ever preached. It was so powerful it was so powerful that at the end of chapter 7, the Bible says that the Jews begin to gnash on Stephen with their teeth. You talk about the power of the Word of God? That's powerful, y'all. 
And then, of course, we know they took him out of the city. They stoned him, making the first martyr of the book of Acts church. And I love his response at the very end of Acts chapter 7 when he looked at him and echoing the words of Jesus said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. You want to talk about an apostolic spirit, an apostolic attitude? That's it right there. To the very last breath, praying for souls, praying for people to be saved, not praying judgment, praying that God would somehow send salvation to them. Acts chapter 8 is about Philip's ministry in Samaria. And I'm going to close. Stand with me, please. Philip's ministry in Samaria. People gave heed to, quote, because they heard and saw the miracles that were done by Philip's hands. Can I tell you, one of the keys to apostolic revival, one of the apostolic revival keys is this. One of the arcs. You can remember it that way. Apostolic revival keys. One of the arcs is this. The word and miracles. Preaching and miracles. Preaching and miracles. The apostolic church is built on preaching and miracles. Preaching the truth. And that's how they turn cities upside down. They didn't turn it upside down by programs. They turned it upside down by preaching and by miracles. And the entire city took notice of what was taking place. In verse 8, my Lord, I was reading this again this morning, and the Holy Ghost got a hold of me. Verse 8, chapter 8 says, and there was great joy in that city. I'm so sick and tired of hearing people talk about how depressed Toledo is and you know, how down it is and economically down. You know what needs to happen? There needs to be a book of Acts church that raises, rises up in this city. That there is great joy in this city. In spite of the circumstances around us, there's great joy in this city. You want to know what kind of city, what kind of city has great joy? A city where there's a move of the Holy Ghost, where there's miracles, signs, and wonders that take place. I refuse to accept all of this junk, this depression, and this discouragement, and all this stuff they try to put on. Don't you dare buy into it, ladies and gentlemen. You're a part of a Book of Acts church. You're a part of a powerful church. It can turn this city upside down. Don't you dare feed into that. Don't you dare get sucked into that vacuum. Oh, man, it's so bad and it's so horrible here. You want to know what it is? It's a city that needs revival. It's a city that needs revival. That's all it is. And great joy in that city. Great joy in that city. And the apostles came, prayed for them, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's a whole different Bible study. And then the last is the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, which I love. Someone who, he was led by God to reach somebody who was an outcast. According to the law, he had no right to go into the temple and worship. But he went anyway. There was something in his heart that was stirring. And God connected a servant. It wasn't one of the twelve. It wasn't a leader of a church. Just... Just a servant in the church. And God miraculously connected him with an outcast of society. And revelation began to come. And you know the story. He was baptized in Jesus' name and Philip was called away. Listen, don't say, well, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a preacher. I'm not this. I'm not that. You know what the apostolic model is? You don't have to be a pastor or a preacher to do great exploits, to do great wonders. You've got to have a right spirit. You've got to be of an honest report. You've got to be full of the Holy Ghost. And you've got to be full of wisdom. And if you've got those characteristics, that makes, you, that makes you a candidate to be used by God mightily. Amen? Anybody getting fired up about this book of Acts stuff? And I'm reading this stuff, and it is like... I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to make you a commitment. I am absolutely 100% committed. 100% committed to doing everything that I can to make myself fall in line with the book of Acts model. Whatever the sacrifice, whatever, whatever I have to do personally, I want to do whatever I have to do to make sure that I fall in line with the book of Acts model because, Brother South Peter, I want, to, I want to see this t city turned upside down for the cause of Jesus Christ. I want to see God turn Toledo upside down. Amen? Apostolic ministry. Yes, sir. You want to sing a chorus? Sing a chorus. You know what? We used to have a lot of Sunday school contests. And we used to sing a little song. 
Everybody put your shoulder to the wheel. Oh, do your duty with a heart full of zeal. If you don't mind working, my Lord said, put your shoulder to the wheel. Sing it with me. Everybody put your shoulder to the wheel. Oh, do your duty with a heart full of zeal. If you don't mind working, my Lord said, put your shoulder to the wheel. That's awesome. Who's ready to work? Anybody ready to go to work in the kingdom of God? You want to know, here's what my desire is. You know what my desire is? I've had people come up and say, man, Brother Dillingham, keep telling those stories. We love the testimonies. We love the miracles. We love you telling all that kind of stuff. You know what my prayer is? My prayer is that you become so highly anointed of God that you grab this microphone and say, hey, listen, let me tell you about the miracle. Let me tell you about the person I prayed for that had cancer and God healed them. Hello? Let me tell you about the person... Let me tell you about the person we just prayed for and God filled them with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you about the person we just baptized in a fountain. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've done it. Baptize people outside. Jesus' name. Anybody ready to be a book of Acts church? Apostolic ministry. Perhaps the conflict might thrust us into a new realm of revival and open up the opportunity for powerful ministry. There's so many things I wish I could say tonight. I appreciate you.